500. G'day, this is x the Phantom Podcast. Our website is chroniclechamber.com and you can subscribe to our podcast via YouTube or through your favourite podcast apps. Um, this is your best place to go for Phantom content on the internet, um, in my humble opinion. Anyway, um, don't forget to give us a rating when you're on your app or on YouTube and make sure you tell them mate about us. My name's Dan Fraser and tonight I'm joined by Jermaine Parker. Um, Jermaine, how are you, mate? Good. Uh, looking forward to tonight. Uh, looking forward to the chat. Um, hopefully I'll learn something. I think I will. And it's always great to talk to fellow fans and creators. Yeah, this is a conversation we probably wanted to have for three or four years and the possibility of the contact or the knowledge of how to contact uh, our guest tonight has only just come to us this year. So we're very excited about it. We have got a special opportunity tonight um, to catch up and have a chat with someone who's made a, a really unique contribution to the fandom world. Um, uh, but most of us, you know, you, yourself and myself included, know very little about um, people who are listening and watching already know who I'm talking about because it was in the title. Uh, George A. Djokovic is the uh, designer designer for the the NECA um, articulated figures that came out um, a couple of years ago and we're delighted to have George A join us tonight. How are you mate? I'm excellent thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Really um, really delighted to be able to talk to you. As I said um, the when the NECA figures came out it was hugely anticipated in the fandom world um, to, to get some really cool and as soon as we saw the designs we we're excited about them. So um, to be able to talk to the man who had well, we'll find out, but I'm imagining a huge role, given that you credited on the back of the box and everything, um, uh, in, in designing those toys and bringing them to us. It was very much a dream of mine since I was about four or five years old. And uh, since I've been in the action figure industry since 2000, I have early sketches in my sketchbook um, around the same year where I was doing the pitch to various different companies um specifically of defenders of the earth as a means to you know i confess to make the phantom <laughs> and yes i'm very much a fan of uh mandrake and and yes certainly flash gordon but uh out of all of them the phantom is my guy and mm. uh, he was for the longest time kind of falling on on deaf ears because uh it's not necessarily your A-list property in the minds of um, a lot of people because it's all about um, whether it's going to be financially viable to do it or not, understandably so. However, I always believed that uh, if done right, there is more than plenty of the Phantom fans, um, as you guys pretty much prove. And it's one of those evergreen characters that is... Um, absolutely timeless and and as iconic as they as they come not to mention that it is for all intents and purposes the very first superhero depending mm -hmm. how you're gonna really uh label superheroes but at the very least i always make a comparison that in a lot of ways if you're gonna consider superman to be the very first costume superhero then the Phantom is to Superman what Led Zeppelin is to heavy metal, because you can say that it's arguable, okay, are they heavy metal or are they hard rock? But they are undoubtedly somebody who inspired and shaped what heavy metal is going to become. So in a lot of ways, that's how I view the Phantom. And might be so, the first time Led Zeppelin's been made mention on this podcast, so <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> Oh, I love it. That's a, that's a good... <laughs> I've, I've jotted that down. I'm going to use that. <laughs> because, you know, it, it seems to me very interesting that um, people, by and large, perceive Batman as a superhero. And I am certainly one of them. I am uh, very much in the camp of people who believe that you don't have to be a meta human with superpowers in order to be a superhero. Um, however, there is always discussion whether or not the Phantom is one. Yet, when you look at the parallels in between the two characters, they are, um, I'm not going to say uncanny, but they're certainly very much present and visible there. And it's obvious that there was a plethora of uh, um, inspirations that came for the Batman from the Phantom. You know, you look at the 
I mean, he has his own Batmobile in the in the form of hero, right? Mm. Uh, Steed is somewhat equal to to the Batman's ride. You certainly look at the Batcave and you look at the Skull Cave. You look at the um, uh, quite a few setting uh, similarities, and it's kind of fairly obvious, right? Not to not to say anything against the originality of Batman because it's obviously standing. Uh, he's standing on, on his own. But anyway, going mm. back to the Phantom. Well, they certainly came out about together. Like, but before we we go into all of this uh, stuff, Georgia, can you tell us a little bit about um, a little bit about yourself? You know, uh, your age as, as uh, or the or the bracket of age as much as you're comfortable. Where you, your 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 background, where you grew up, and and how you've ended up where you are. I am fifty, and um, I was born in Germany, but I'm not German. I'm a Serbian because um, my parents were living in Germany at the time. Um, so I moved back to Serbia, then Yugoslavia, uh, when I was about three years old or so. And I spent most of my youth in Serbia. Um, I moved to U.S. when I was about 24. And throughout my whole life, I was... Uh, occupied with with uh, various forms of art basically so be it illustration be it sculpting i started sculpting when i was about three and a half and um, oh, wow. you know i did it pretty much daily you know until the time when i discovered girls and then i kind of <laughs> you know moved away from it for for a, a few years and then of course he was calling me back so then i then i came back to it um and i don't think i was really looking at it as my life's profession until Masters of the Universe. And I think that that was the pivotal point where I was just blown away with, again, level of sophistication um, of sculpting on, on, on those figures. And I know that they are uh, most often being viewed for either the squat stances or for, uh, you know, the play features. But to me, it was their ability to appear alive and to appear to appear uh, as if though they're going to burst out of the package any second. And prior to that point, you look at it, most of the action figures were looking like Barbie's Ken, and they were having a very mild smile on their face, and they were very much in a vanilla neutral pose, and they were, um, so to speak, uh, uh, lifeless. You know, they were, again, very, very charming. But they didn't have uh, uh, that, that um, I don't know, uh, visceral feeling to them that Masters of the Universe really brought. Mm -hmm. So that was the very first time when I looked at action figures and, and thought, okay, this is it for me. This is something that I would absolutely love to do as my life calling. And um, life was chugging along and I was uh, studying uh, graphic design and illustration. And um, basically, did a lot of work and a lot of, um, I was fascinated by uh, the package design and graphic design in general, but ultimately I was gravitating towards, towards going back to sculpting. So in a lot of ways, I used my graphic design um, skills to get into the industry because um, I was at the time, that was like the late nineties, I was uh, very much, um, in love with what Art Asylum uh, action figure company was doing at the time. And because they were, you know, very much, in my view, pushing certain boundaries alongside with the, with the McFarlane toys at, at the time. So um, I was basically trying to get a job there as a sculptor. And at the time, they had a really... Um, kind of full house as far as the sculptors go, but there was an opening uh, for me to do package design. And that's how I got my foot in the door, so to speak, and uh, started in the action figure industry. That wasn't just like, okay, let me just try to get my foot in the door and let me just do whatever I can to switch to sculpting. I was very much heart and soul into the package design and I got very much, um, taking away by it, really. Um, so 
my first five years in the industry, I spent uh, pretty much exclusively as a, as a, a package designer. However, there was still this this uh, desire of mine to go into sculpting. So parallel to it, I don't even recall exactly maybe 2003 or four, something like it. I started sculpting um, with an intent of pitching a project uh, um, to be produced. So let me backtrack a tiny bit around 2000 and maybe two or three, I met the four horsemen and uh, we just clicked it off, uh, hit it off. We, we clicked basically. And um, it, it seemed that we very much shared a lot of the same design sensibilities, a lot of the same aspirations. And uh, they just seemed like a really good uh, set of guys obviously very creative, but also extremely nice people. And specifically, I um, very much befriended Eric Treadway, um, who is pretty much my age and pretty much grew up on, on a lot of the same stuff. He's, he's a year older. Uh, he grew up on the same um, stuff that I have, and he's created uh, just uh, countless figures for countless different properties. And I absolutely loved his uh, both uh, sculpting style and his design sensibility. Consequently, at the time, Four Horsemen were looking for a package designer for uh, their upcoming property that they were going to venture into production of their own figures. So they asked me to do it. And that's how the ball kind of got rolling regarding um, my sculpting in a roundabout way. How did that, how did that happen is that um, I asked Eric at one point when I was, I don't even remember, like halfway through the um, package design of, of uh, Magma Core, which was their very first action figure line. And I asked him if he would be open to giving me a shot at sculpting one of the masters of the universe. And um, I told him, I will do everything for free. And if he doesn't meet your, your level of expectation and, and your level of quality, we just shake hands. I have, you know, a copy of it for myself and that's going to be that. And um, would you consider to just, um, give it give it a give it a look and give it a give it a chance and he's like yeah i would absolutely be open to it i asked him to sculpt jitsu jitsu from masters of the universe and that was very significant character for me personally for a set of different reasons that i'm not gonna uh, bother you with and um, that was basically my introduction to professional sculpting because i i sculpted it they loved it then they it became part of the line very tail end of the line which just so happens to be produced by NECA. And in the meantime, I befriended Randy, uh, Randy Falk from NECA, who is another amazing, um, very unique uh, toy creator and unique in the sense that he's um, incredibly knowledgeable and incredibly bright. But his knowledge of uh, pop culture in general, you know, beat, uh, comic books, be it action figures, be it movies, music, you name it, is pretty much uh, uh, second to none because he does have this encyclopedia, really, of the pop culture in his mind. Yet again, he is very much in tuned into what out of those things could be uh, applicable to action figures. And in a lot of ways, um, I consider him to be quite singular in that role of product manager because certain things that just had no business being made into, into reality in plastic form due to various different uh, obstacles, he was able to overcome and able to make into reality. So uh, pretty much how, I, how I've gotten um, in working relationship with Randy and Neca and so on. So that's, that's how the ball cool. started rolling. One of the one of the things that I find interesting about your story um, is that you actually are a Phantom fan. 
Um, you told us before the podcast how you became a phantom, but I was just wondering if you could tell us on the podcast for those listeners how you became interested in the phantom and that, or how the phantom found you. I was about four or five years old. And uh, my dad, who is extremely well-read uh, person, whose life's passion was both writing and reading. Uh, so he had uh, uh, just a variety and a ton of different books. And one day when I was playing around in his closet, I found a stash of comic books. And uh, he was very much a comic book fan as well, being that he grew up on a lot of the Golden Age characters, specifically um, Flash Gordon, Mandrake, and certainly the Phantom. So uh, it was a stash of mostly Italian comic books, which were, like I mentioned before, a little bit smaller in size than your regular DC or Marvel comic books, um, at least, you know, published in the US. And out of all of them, the one that really captured my imagination uh, and caught my attention was the Phantom. And on the cover of that of that specific comic book, all I remember is that it was a painting of the Phantom who was fighting a lion. And at the time, I was uh, I thought that his costume was red because it was Italian comic book, and lastly, his costume was was red. Um, inside of it. Um, it was Cyberry's comic book. So this, we are talking about maybe 77 or 78, something like that. And I was, I was just uh, enchanted pretty much from the, from the first moment that, that I've seen the character. So from that point forward, I was uh, seeking out to find uh, the same Phantom comic books in Serbian and, and read a ton of them. And uh, going back to the Ray Moore's run and then, you know, all the way up. But by and large, my uh, depiction of the Phantom has been forever cemented as Cy Berry's interpretation of the Phantom. And being that I was very much a huge fan of action figures since I was, you know, the from the earliest childhood, I always wanted to have the Phantom action figure. Um, so basically, I, I was a fan of comic books since then and never truly stopped. And uh, nowadays, I'm not seeking comic books and exploring them as uh, actively as I used to be. But my love very much remains to this day. Hmm. So what I was suppose it? This... I'm sorry. sorry to cut you. What, what was it specifically about the Phantom that made you like? I, I can understand the immediate appeal of this action shot with the lion, and we've all got those those covers and those stories that grabbed us. But what kept you? You said you went back to Raymore's run, and you and you've read through. What is it about the Phantom as a character and the Phantom's universe that Lee Fork created that um that that's held you as a fan for so long? I I guess I could give you two answers. One of them is that it's the perfect balancing between the light and the dark in a lot of ways. And the other one is the whole lore. It's the fact that you have this one, I don't even know if I understood it as uh, clearly as a kid as I am at least viewing it now. Mm. What is it that gives one human being this one idea that he, or in some cases she, holds on for 22 generations and never lets go. That's an extremely powerful thing. And especially if you know that it's about an idea and an ideal to hold on to certain noble cause and carry it on. Because I kept on thinking in a, in a um, I don't know, somewhat more recent years of my life, thinking about the character, what is it that, okay, you're growing up with your dad who is larger than life figure and who is somebody who is both adored and feared by the jungle folk and, and, and past, right? Um, but you have this idea that there's a mantle that you are about to inherit one day when once you become of age and once you 
fully grow into the best version of yourself. And that comes with the baggage of generations, comes with the baggage of certain things that you need to uphold, that you need to live up to and spend most of your uh, life in mask, essentially. And I would imagine this life of a child who's living this, uh, I don't know if I would call it carefree life, but in the jungle, surrounded with, if you're adapted to it, a perfect playground, because you have kids around you from, from the tribe people, you have, so obviously they're like your brothers and sisters, so there's a camaraderie, there's closeness to it that I would, I don't know, link to maybe Apocalypto, and you, you think about how um, wonderfully portrayed the whole family life was in the movie Apocalypto and how closely knit they all are. And that's how I would imagine the Phantoms growing up was in his earlier age before he was sent off to uh, education abroad, right? Um, obviously, you become very, very close to the nature. You consider it yourself to be one with it and the same with animals. And all of a sudden, you're kind of lifted out of that environment at a fairly young age, you are being brought to a concrete jungle of a completely different set of morals and a different set of rules, different culture, certainly. And then your life kind of expands. Your life views kind of expand. And at one point, you're going to question whether you or not you want to go back to your jungle life. And it was fascinating to me to think about what is it that not only would uh, make this young person want to go back because there had to be certain psychological turmoil. No doubt he must have fallen in love or she must have fallen in love in another person somewhere else. And then what exactly is your reality after a few years being spent at uh, college or high school, whatever it was, right? Um, only to come back to this one idea and say, okay, well, all of this idea that my father was carrying a torch why am i going to pick it up so there are, there are so many levels to that story and the fact that there is at least to my knowledge that i can think of the only superhero that lasted in fiction i'm not talking about you know character almost coming up to the 90 years of existence in comic books i'm talking about the lore itself it was 21 generations, and if you want to look at the Phantom uh, 2040, uh, the thing is that that's like, what, uh, 24th Phantom, if I remember correctly? Yeah. So, and, and in the, the Defenders of Earth, Earth. 27th or 28th. 20, yeah. right? so, so the whole thing is that it's a fascinating idea. Hmm. And you look at the whole, the whole thing of, okay, there's a Skull Cave. I can... I can buy the whole, maybe I'm rationalizing all of this too much, but you're asking me why is it that I was drawn to it so much. So these yeah. are some of the, the aspects of it. Mm. I can buy the idea of, you know, somebody starting his mission with duality. One is to get a revenge and the other one is to never allow the same thing to happen to somebody else what happened to his father. And, you know, the faith of being hopeless, helpless at that particular point and seeing somebody else in charge of the life of the loved one. So then you're going to take it into your own hands. So I can buy the idea of this person being so driven to make a sculptural, whatever he was. Maybe he was befriending uh, the tribesmen so much that they helped him chisel it out of the stone or that he did it himself because he was like, Count Monte Cristo, whatever the, the, the case is, right? However, I cannot buy the idea of anybody building the skull cave. Reason why I'm saying all of this is, are the things pre, predetermined? Was it faith? Was it something that was guiding this one person to go and be who he was meant to be? Was it, and of course you have like the, the, the hilltop, the mountain with the phantom's face and so on. So there are so many things that are giving us hints of 
destiny just meant for this one being to become a more than just a human being and use him as, as a conduit or whatever is it that you want to see it as. 22 generations, or in some cases, like we mentioned, 27 generations, whatever the case is, you look at the Whispering Woods, you look at the uh, all of those things of the lore, it's just fascinating to me because it's making me think about, I suppose, the destiny itself or duality of where is it that we draw the line of where is it that your idea or in this case, obsession of righting the wrong becomes something that shapes your life to this is what your life is going to be until the end of your days. You're going to be wearing these purple tights and the mask in front of most of the people that you see your whole life. Just fascinating. I think you, you know, you're speaking to two other people that have very similar thoughts, very similar uh, addictions or obsessions and stuff like that as well. So it's always nice uh, talking to a kindred spirit. Absolutely. And and most of the listeners and viewers will be nodding along as well, I suspect. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you made mention of 2040 and Defenders of the Earth. Were you, and we kind of make mention of those, but were you a fan of those? Did you like the toys? What was your Post experience cabinet. with the toys? I did not like them. I love them, even though I have said that I wish that they were more. Yeah. They were still representing characters that I loved, done with obviously enough of love. So mm. in my view, you can see if somebody's coasting through certain projects or if somebody is like, uh, you know, putting at least a little bit of a heart and soul into it. And to me, there's, um, let's start with the Defenders of the Earth. Let's start with the toys. I find them very, very charming to this day. It's one of the, one of the figures that, I don't know, uh, still kind of makes a warm and fuzzy feeling to me. Looking at them, you know, whatever it is, like 30 years later, 30 plus years later. I'll put my hand up, uh, Georgia, and say that uh, the Galoob Phantom um, Defenders of the Earth figure, I, I received it as a Christmas present, I think, when I was eight or nine, and it was my favourite toy for years and years and years, and, and he's sitting in one of these cabinets behind me, um, as well as a new one with uh, in the box, of course. But um, I, I'm with you. The, the, it was really charming. It was great, a great toy. I enjoyed using the dial on the back to, to punch things with, but... Um, not not anywhere as dynamic as the as the other characters that you're you're referencing with Masters of the Universe and um, you know where you've taken it. Thank you so much. Just one second, please. I would like to show you something. Yep. <laughs> so you did not have to, that. You didn't have to look hard for that. <laughs> Pretty close. So, so for people who are just listening, um, you've got a boxed, um, again, a Galoob figure on card uh, behind plexiglass and um, it took you seconds to reach it from where you're sitting. So uh, obviously yeah. something that's yeah. on display close to you. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and the thing is that, and it actually goes for the, for the same line. I only brought two for now. But yes, um, I was, that was obviously during, during 80s and at the time, Again, Masters kind of changed everything. So mm. I think that everybody tried to be Pepsi to Masters of the Universe Coke. And mm. obviously, only selected few are going to be able to achieve that. Thundercats was probably Pepsi. And then you look at all of the other ones who were trying to, you know, follow in the same footsteps, be it Silverhawks, be it Street Sharks, whatever, uh, um, Centurions, whatever it is. So when Galoob, well, when King Features decided to kind of throw their head into the ring by combining the existing heroes, I was thrilled because it was, uh, it was them basically trying to be in the game, be, you know, as successful as they can be, but at the same time, they're still using uh, beloved and existing characters that that generation didn't necessarily know much about. Mm -hmm. So to me, it was such a thrilling idea. 
And when the figures came out, I was rooting so uh, so hard for them. And I was very much bummed to see that they were only six figures. But I loved them anyway. And it was, uh, I'm, I'm uh, just thrilled that they, they happened, that somebody actually did try that. And that the show yeah. existed. Yeah, the show mm. the show was amazing. It was um, you know, you, you, you it, it's so that area you've got like Captain uh Captain Planet, you've got all the that that whole eighties, nineties and the figurines. You've I'm looking, I can see the skull copter, I can see the claw copter where I'm looking, I can see the little figurines in the blister packs and yeah, it was it was really exciting. It was just a pity that it took what is it? Uh, thirty odd years for us to get a decent uh, phantom well, not... figure in afterwards. <laughs> I suppose you did say the word decent in there. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's worth it's worth asking you, George. Yeah, the the one that came out around ninety six uh, attached to the movie. There was the um, uh, yeah, street players was the, was the mob that brought it out. I don't like to be negative. I was fairly heartbroken because. Um, I remember reading about, oh, you know, somebody is, is Joe Dante is supposed to direct the Phantom. And then it was, uh, I forgot who else was supposed to direct it at the time. So they were going back and forth about the prospect of live action Phantom movie for years, as you know. And with uh, atomic bomb of a, of a, paradigm shift that was Burton slash Keaton 89 Batman that all of the sudden kind of opened the doors for superhero interpretations. Um, but unlike today, as, as you know, it was uh, such a tall order to really make any of the superhero movies. And I was rather skeptical whether it's ever going to happen, but very much hopeful. So the whole idea when when I finally read, okay, they actually have the actor. It is gonna be Billy Zane, which whom I've seen only in uh, in the Sniper prior to that point. And I remember thinking that physically speaking, he was perfect because there's certain you know check marks that you need to or check boxes that you need to check in order to be a good Phantom. And, you know, the overall shape of the nose, the overall, almost like a boxer nose and the overall, obviously, chin, the voice is huge, uh, posture, uh, yes, even the height, the body type, so on. He was really looking physically um, like an absolutely uh, a spot on choice to me. Mm. So I was very much excited. And then Simon, Simon Vincer is directing it, blah, blah, blah. I wasn't really all that familiar with, with his work. But I was very much hopeful. Then the movie comes out, and then I was like, surely there's going to be a bunch of action figures. And when I saw what, what came out, that to me looked like a job. And that to me did not look like something that, again, it's like, maybe this person who sculpted it is going to look at this and, and uh, I don't know, uh, think that I'm a scumbag for saying it, but that is honestly uh, nowhere near the level of most successful figures at that time. Mm. So oh. yes, that was that was heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. I, I think. Well, oh, don't do that, Jim. Yeah, so I've got him here. Uh, the thing is that the head looks like an owl. <laughs> um, it looks I remember. Like a right yeah, because I remember I remember playing with GI Joes. I used to have GI Joes uh, as a kid, and I remember getting this, and it was it was embarrassing. Um, you know, as a as a new fan, which I was at the time, having this figurine, I didn't mind the guns. I thought the guns were kind of cool. The belt kind of came off and all that, but the head was yeah, it was pretty disappointing. It looked childlike. Showing the eyes. I mean, uh, this is this yeah. speaks to what you said there, Georgia. It, it looks like a job. It wasn't someone's passion, was it? It wasn't a mm. fan who did that. That was someone who's just gone, oh, okay, I've got to do a phantom. I'll knock that out by lunch so I can head home early on my Friday. <laughs> yep. And I mean, it's like, well, there, there are two thoughts that, that I'll kind of leave it on. One is the body. And there's just no excuse. You look at it and 
I can go back to either 60s or 70s even. You look at, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar at all with the really limited run of the Mego figures, which were just four figures, two were DC and two were Marvel, Superman, Batman, uh, Spider-Man and the Hulk. And they had magnetic joints. I'm not talking about Migos in removable outfits. I'm talking about the figures who are, which were made uh, purely in plastic and uh, they had some metal parts inside its own. And you look at the anatomy sculpting there and it's, it's wonderful. It's somewhat simplified, again, compared to the masters. However, it is spot on or all of the muscle groups are where they're supposed to be the body proportions are right and so on this one looks you know very this phantom looks um very amateurish it looks mm. as if though this person did not re really even bother to crack open anatomy book or attend uh a live uh, drawing or sculpting class as far as like the face goes i was very much looking forward to seeing billy zane's likeness in the figure if nothing else yep. and you know you look at the figures of that time i'm not even going to go to mcfarland for example or let me go to kenner and you look at the uh, we were mentioning batman at that time a year prior to it batman forever came out and you look at the faces on um uh, either val kilmer or jim carrey or tommy lee jones interpretation and they were wonderful it's one of those cases where can it be done more detailed? Yes. Is it toy-like? A little bit, sure. But it absolutely, uh, you know, captures the essence of what those actors look like. And in my view, those are absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, the Phantom, however, is not. So anyway. The more you've been talking, I've been sitting here posing my toy and getting the um and looking looking at the detailed anatomy and all the rest of it, going, yeah, again, how much better is this? I mean, the the, the technology, as you say, existed at the time for the the likeness to be there. Um, we do seem to have come a long way though, in terms of like points of articulation and the the materials that are available to to put the toy together. I guess I guess um leading into you know the the neck of toys, and I'm really keen you sort of took us up to the point where you met Randy Fork and, and we're about to start working on these toys. But before you, the, the, the question that struck me at that point was, I'm not even sure exactly what a sculptor does, to be honest. Like, I understand the concept, um, but like you, you said you were sculpting from the age of three and a half, four. I assume that's with clay and dirt and that's what I don't, I don't know. So can you take me on that journey of a, of a sculptor from a, from a, a kid starting to play in the sandpit sort of thing through to um how do what how is it that how do you do what you do with these things <laughs> well as far as like the very early uh the very beginning it was back in former yugoslavia there is a play-doh like substance it's not oh, it's not as foamy i suppose is the best way to describe it you know how I, I assume that you you guys are familiar with um, you know the slimes and foams that kids play with. So yes. in my view, uh, Play-Doh is a little bit more foam-like, and the Play-Doh-like uh, compound that I was playing with when I was a kid was a, a slightly more towards the clay side, and it was wonderful. Um, he basically started as uh, a, a little pack of six different colors that they later on expanded to eight colors. And of course, you can mix all of those colors and come up with all sorts of um, nuances uh, color-wise. And that's what I, what I uh, started as. And then the problem with that one is that it's, it's not responding all that well to, uh, to dust. So it, over the course of time, it kind of picks up dust and it's not something that assumes a rigid form at any point. Uh, it's very pliable and it reacts to the heat of your fingers. And then it becomes slightly more pliable, but it's by and large, it's, it's fairly soft at all times, even when you leave it alone and when it uh, cools off, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, 
but obviously being a kid's sculpting sculpting compound it's not uh requiring any heating tools or um it's essentially you know in the same shape uh whether you work with it or not then i i started working with clay um and that was pretty much the extent of my um uh, experimenting with different uh, uh compounds before i went into professional sculpting with professional sculpting i started with uh pretty much with castellin uh, from day one and then i was dabbling I'll, I'll explain that in a second um and i was dabbling with uh pink wax gray wax uh, and some chevant clay so all of those are essentially different materials that toy sculptors mostly use or have used and without going into too much minutia, I'm boring all of you out of your skulls with, you know, uh, properties of each one of them. The one that was mostly pretty much a, a industry standard prior to the digital sculpting is uh, castellin. And castellin is um, technically a wax. And it's not as brittle as, say, jeweler's wax. Uh, it's more pliable, but it's also a lot more rigid than the regular clay. Uh, and it allows you to make figures maybe 12 inch or even 18 inch without any uh, armature whatsoever because it can hold its form really well. But if you either put it in a microwave or apply some, some uh, uh, fire with a dentist torch, it becomes soft to the point that it can become like a soup but once it cools off it very much retains its shape it's not a rock hard uh, compound but it still retains its shape and you can get incredible amount of detail on it quickly so when you're doing that is that do you start off with just the base figure or do i use i use like going into like the muscles the eyebrows the nose are you going into that much detail or is it just like the general form the answer is yes to both, meaning that I start with the general form. So how it starts is literally you get a brick of uh, it's just a, it's just a you know square uh, uh, chunk of of clay, hmm. and basically you heat it up, and then you start you know building a stick figure like. Um, then you start building up on top of it, uh, adding on or taking away until you get to the point that you're going to uh, start defining it. Once you get the overall human form, the overall anatomy right or drapery right on top of it, uh, if it's like heavily clothed uh, character or in the Phantom's case, obviously skin tight, so it's almost like a naked human body. So you make sure that all of the proportions are right. And then you start detailing uh, further. You're not using like a figurine underneath it, like a Barbie doll or a can or something like that. You're making the whole body out of the clay rather than using another figurine and then building on top of that figurine. Is that right? If somebody's tasking me to do a job hmm. and giving me existing figure to, uh, 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 to sculpt on top of it, that could mean uh, saving some time and a shortcut to some sculptors. To me, that's a torture. To me, it's one of those things that um, you need to be authentic to what you're doing. Yeah. It's not about making money. It's not about cutting time. Yes, I love to get money. Yes, I love to have abundance of time. But I also love to be as honest and earnest towards any sculpture that I do as humanly possible. Mm. And you can do that only by starting from scratch, unless yeah. it's warranted. For example, if I'm doing uh, Defenders of the Earth and all of them are going to share the same body, then it's only natural for me to reuse that body. Mm. But I uh, I think it's it's uh, pivotal and, and crucial mm. to really start off from from scratch whenever possible, whenever applicable, because 
that's going to help you determine what the style is, the overall art direction is, because that's one of the things that I've, that I find find most intriguing and satisfying uh, about uh, action figure design and and sculpting is the overall art, art direction. Not every figure is going to have the same anatomy. Not every figure is going to have the same artistic approach. Some of them are going to be slightly more angular, slightly more stylized. The other ones are going to be slightly more realistic and their body proportions are going to be uh, slightly less comic book-like. Uh, They're not going to be as exaggerated. So thusly, it's crucial to start it from a blank slate whenever possible. It's, mm. it's not always possible, but yes. What, what scale is your original sculpt in? Do you, you, is it exactly the same as what we see? Or are you, you creating it bigger and then it's um, reduced for production? Or what's the scale you use? That also is kind of uh, all over the place. Whenever possible, I do like to go one-to-one. -one. Um, and in some cases, it's common to go two up or one and a half up. Specifically with NECA, in my earlier days with them, it was most of the cases two up. So if you have a seven inch figure, then the prototype would be anywhere in between 12 to 14 inches. Um, in some cases, 10 inches, if it's like a female character. Um, and I kind of feel comfortable with either. There are pros and cons for both. If given okay. opportunity to go two up, you can squeeze a lot more detail into it. Unlike mm -hmm. digital sculpting, where you can, you're obviously not not uh, uh, limited at all. You can zoom in as much as you want, uh, zoom out uh, equally as much. But with uh, traditional sculpting, two up gives you opportunity to go very much uh, super detailed. However, I feel very comfortable just sculpting in six or seven inch scale. Um, like most of my Masters of the Universe work has been, I'm trying to think, with the exception of one single figure, all of my Masters of the Universe figures were done one-to-one. -one. Uh, okay. Defenders of the Earth were also done all one-to-one. -one. So and were Defenders of the Earth done by using the, 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 the gasoline clay stuff or was it done by a digital sculpt? All traditional orchestral all traditional. or all redundant gasoline, except for one single character, uh, Garrix. Garrix yes. is the only one that was done uh, digitally, and uh, that's the only Defenders character that I have not sculpted. I sculpted the rest of them. Even Zuffy, the uh, companion to the Phantom? Oh, hell yeah. Was, Zuffy all the way. Was Zuffy your... Uh, was, was Zuffy your baby to get it into the um into the set because it i thought it was a bit of a weird choice but by the way you've just made mention of zaffy it might make me it makes me think that you were the uh the person behind getting zaffy in there a, a thousand percent and the thing <laughs> is that because the thing is think about it in some ways with my selfishness putting aside uh, and by selfishness i mean any aspirations, uh, you know, to have a particular toy and, oh, I, I really want the Phantom or I really want Zafia or I really want, to, you know, fill in the blank. There is a huge responsibility as a toy creator or a toy designer, sculptor, to give fans whatever is it that they might want. And as such, this is Defenders of the Earth were specifically very much 80s property. Mm. And uh, what is one of the tropes uh, in a lot of cases beloved by the fans? It's this goofy, often super annoying, cutesy <laughs> psychic that originated in the Masters of the Universe again with Orko and everybody wanted to strangle Orko, including <laughs> myself. And then you look at the snarf and then you look at, you know, go down the line and there's always a goofy cutesy psychic and defenders of the earth had Zafi. And I think what a wonderful thing to just include a pivotal little annoyance 
which became <laughs> so dear to so many of us because, you know, I didn't think that anybody would even think that Defenders of the Earth, Earth would be resurrected because it's like a D-list property. Mm. However, that's going to bring me to, uh, to the inception of the line, which, which I'll get to in a moment after I rag on Zafi enough. <laughs> so, so then it was one of those things that, you know, it's going to be a hit of nostalgia. And yes. it's not calculated in a sense, oh, that's going to sell, but rather it's going to bring a smile to people's faces, hopefully, who were into that cartoon, all 17 of us. And it's, and it's another, and it, I, I have to give a, a kind of a shout out to, uh, to Stefan Falkins, who is uh, um, one of the guys in NECA. And he is overseeing um, a lot of the, the, the production aspects of it and works with China and so on. There was a point, because obviously, as you guys know, the cost uh, is very much an issue. And in a lot of cases, lines never happen because of the cost of tooling specifically. So Zafi was uh, in jeopardy at one point. And mm. it wasn't in jeopardy that he's going to uh, get cut because you know the cost started raising because the figures are so modular because obviously there's so much articulation then you know ming the merciless specifically had so many paint hits they were coming with a pretty hefty amount of of uh, accessories and then at one point you know the the tooling costs started raising and they were like well we gotta cut all of the articulation from from zafi and i was very very adamant that i didn't want just like a applause or schleich type of PVC figure that comes, you know, with the, with the Phantom in this case of Zafi, because it would seem like a cop-out. I love those PVC figures, but not with action figures, because you think about the original Thundercats and, you know, Snarf was not articulated. It was, uh, you know, Orca was, was a figure by himself, but it was barely articulated. So I was like, okay, how awesome would it be to have fully articulated uh, um, Zafi within reason, obviously, because you know he's limited with his anatomy. He's so tiny. And at one point it was like, okay, the articulation on Zafi has to go. So that's when, when Stefan was actually able to pull off a miracle and somehow made it work. So shout out to him. Speaking of shout outs, the way how it all, all began, I don't believe, and speaking of the costs, right? I don't think that there would be too many same people I, I would be able to convince to make Defenders of the Earth from scratch because it was not too viable of an option, financially speaking. And it wasn't something that you would think is going to make a tremendous amount of money. And there's a significant uh, investment. So what happened is that one year, uh, Randy kind of called me out of the blue. And uh, he's like, oh, I got something really, really good for you. Long story short is he wanted me to sculpt uh, Batman to, to go in a two-pack with the Predator based on a 90s, 90s comic book. And it was supposed to be just Batman in his anti-Predator uh, armor. And um, that was supposed to be it. Then Randy and me started talking about possibility of making two figures to make removable armor if possible and make it work as the Batman without the armor and so on. So then I used that to pitch him a full mini line of DC superheroes. So if we could make, obviously, um, we couldn't make DC superheroes by themselves. It would have to be something that was uh, in the, the Dark Horse crossover with either Alien or Predator, which is why I said earlier what I said about Randy, that he is singular. Because, you know, um, Mattel at the time having the license or McFarlane taking over the license of DC, it was impossible for NECA to get uh, seven-inch figures uh, of DC characters done. 
And somehow he was able to make the miracle happen. And this is what we started with. This particular Batman. And this is one of the figures that I pitched it as continuation of the line. And if you look at it, there is a lot of parts reuse. And the, mm. the only reason why we were, we were able to make that line, in addition to Randy's ability to just basically uh, find a back door and a small opening for you know, NECA to actually produce the seven inch figures uh, of the DC characters uh, was the share tooling. So one time, fast forward, whatever it was, like a, like a year or a couple of years from that point forward, I was obsessed with wanting to pitch the Defenders of the Earth because again, that's like my means to make the Phantom figure. And, um, and don't get me wrong, again, I wanted to make Flash Gordon almost as much, the Mandrake almost as much, and so on, and Lothar. Certainly Ming. So um, after a, a pretty grueling day of, of Toy Fair, I forgot what it was, if it was like uh, nine, uh, 2018, I believe, or something along those lines, I don't remember. And so I went to the NECA booth and Randy was like completely fried because, you know, he was talking the entire day. To, to the customers and so on. And it's like, you know, pretty intense um, days whenever you're, you're at a toy fair, in his position, certainly. So, you know, he had a, a quiet moment and I was very much fried just as much because I was also yapping about with a bunch of other people networking. Because to me, you know, toy fairs are, are always a, a pretty big, big networking um, opportunity. So we sat down, shared a quiet moment for, for a second. And then, then I asked him, how did you do with, you know, the DC stuff, blah, blah, blah. Then he told me, and then I was like, what would you say if I told you that if you granted me about two or two and a half uh, new figures worth of tooling, I could give you a whole new line based on this body, the DC body, um, of maybe five to six figures. And then he's like, uh oh, what is it? So then I told him that it was Defenders of the Earth and then he just like, no, <laughs> just like shot me down <laughs> straight away. And he's like, this is, this is probably better suited for some other company. And uh, that was it. So then I went home and I was like, okay, I have a lemon. Let me try to make a lemonade. <laughs> so then I was like, knowing that certain people respond better to showing than telling. I went, I sculpted the phantom on the existing uh, Green Lantern body. And so obviously he, he had new parts. And yes, um, there were a ton of improvements. Uh, over the DC body, we did not leave it at that, but that's that's a story for later on. Long story short, is like I sculpted it, finished it, and asked Randy, okay, um, could I steal ten minutes of your time? And you know, I, I'd like to show you something. Sure, no problem. I go to the studio, and he was busy at the time. He's like, oh, whatever you have, like place it on a table. And I'll, I'll be with you in like 10 minutes or whatever after I'm done with the meeting. And he passed by and just didn't want to look, but just kind of peripheral vision. He's like, oh, uh oh. And he just said, oh, you were really serious with this. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, right, I was serious. He went, you know, back from his meeting, looked at it. Then I gave him the whole plan, how that would look. Basically, I showed him the Phantom and then I broke it down what new tooling we needed for each one of the characters, which one of them is going to be entirely new tool, Mandrake, and then what else is like heavily reused and what is like partially reused and so on. Without Randy, that would have never happened because, mm -hmm. again, it's his ability to see potential in something that 
is good, in my opinion, at least. Not only that we had, um, we agreed that we wanted to do it, but he was on the phone uh, within a couple of hours. He already had a verbal agreement with King, King Features. Oh, wow. Nothing was signed, but he already, within the same day, had a verbal agreement and the ball was rolling from that point forward. And um, after we've gotten the first wave of defenders on the market, we already had plans and development was already done on the original superheroes version of, of uh, those characters. So that was, that was uh, the full line was done prior to, I believe the first wave even, even hitting the, the market. I, I honestly believe that a lot of people would uh, just not be open to that idea because, again, Defenders was not in most people's um, focus nor have been uh, lighting the world on fire. But I honestly believed that there is a lot of potential in it because the characters are awesome. And if done properly, that can be just a breath of fresh air in between all of those used and overused and over recycled um, properties such as how many iterations of Star Wars have you seen? How many iterations mm. of Transformers or Power Rangers or Ninja Turtles or, you know, there is whatever, handful of properties, Marvel, DC, you've seen, by this point, you've probably seen like 500 different iterations of Batman in, in the past 10 years alone. Um, Likewise for for Spidey and so on, and I'm all for it. I love all of those, but I do believe that there's a tiny bit of um, place under the sun for properties like these, and I do believe that they will create enough of excitement if done with proper care and love. Mm. Well, I think well, I think we've so, sorry. I think we've seen that because once you release these, we've seen. Mad Cave uh, have now re-released the the uh, hardback of the comics. You've got um, Boss Fights have released. Uh, you know they've kind of released a bit of a um, uh, a Flash Gordon and and Phantom and Mandrake and stuff like that as well. So I think we've seen the potential because of what has happened with you guys. I noticed um, even King have now got a Defenders of the Earth license that they uh, are now providing or now offering to, to companies as well. So because of what you guys have done, I think we're seeing that. Well, thank you so much. I, if that is indeed true, which I, I think there are um, good indications for, I mm. am... Very honored and very uh, quietly, a little bit humbled uh, because to this day, I can kind of see myself pretty much as the same kid as I was all of those years ago and kind of seeing the Phantom for the first time. And I can't help but still be as giddy and excited about prospect of whatever contribution we've had, you know, on it, it very much makes me... I don't know, extremely grateful, extremely mm. uh, happy. <laughs> it's very humble of you, George, to give so much credit to Randy for listening to your idea, but it does sound like, um, you know, you, had, you put the idea in front of him, you wouldn't take no for an answer, you went back with it um, and, and you really tried to carve out a, a space here. It, it's worth, and, and, and it's massive credit to you and, and, and our thanks to you for doing that. Um, you mentioned there about, you know, the, the financial viability of of these characters do you have any idea as to whether they've covered costs for the extra tooling that you needed to do and, and like would would NECA say it was worth it was financially worth doing i hope so the short answer is yes absolutely oh, good. yes they absolutely made a profit with them did they uh light the world on fire like the turtles would be or some of their core properties or or even gargoyles um no. Uh, did I ever expect him to? No. Uh, if you're owner of the company, you may say to yourself, okay, well, there's this amount of work and money that I'm allocating to, and it's going to give me this much. 
it is a profit, but it's giving me this much. Or I could put in the same amount of money and work and get this much. So then from that perspective, you all can be individually a judge of whether it was, uh, you know, viable or not. To me, it's a tremendous success due to different reasons. And again, I'm trying to get my personal selfish reasons out of it <laughs> because I admit it. I am selfish uh, in terms of being biased. Yes, I wanted the Phantom figure. I wanted Mandrake. I wanted all of those characters, but never at the expense of uh, my employer's benefit. Meaning that mm. if a client of mine is trusting me with whatever amount of money, I feel tremendous pressure. I am not just a work for hire then. In my mm. mind, I am not okay, you paid me to do this job, I'm going to get the job, I'm going to get you the best possible uh, sculpture and design that I can give you, and that's it. And then the rest is kind of up to you. I can't and refuse to think that way because I've been given trust by somebody. Yes, he's his own grown man and everything, but he trusted me yep. and trusted my instincts. So the whole thing is I feel very much, you know, um, I'm not going to say tremendous amount of pressure because it sounds so stifling, sounds so, uh, you know, doom and gloom. But I am absolutely very, very much aware of uh, what needs to come with it. And I will do anything that I can to minimize the risks before I ever propose it and to make sure that they're successful. So they would never go into original superheroes head defenders not being successful enough to warrant it. Yeah. Um, and secondly, the reason why I, I consider that to be success, objectively speaking, is because of what you said about ripple effect of King Features now having the separate license for defenders, seeing those little foam keychains, I'm not sure if you've seen them, which were modeled yeah. exactly by our figures, all of the choices, the design choices, everything is, you know, very much unmistakably uh, based on it. reason why I'm saying that is because it obviously made some tiny bit of uh, cultural awareness. And mm. like within the figure community, hopefully it was uh, a topic of the conversation. Mm. And to me, that is equating to getting more people aware of a company which is already uh, notably very much in the, in the minds uh, and eyes of figure collectors. But it is mostly in the domain of movies, of horror, of specific IPs that people expect from NECA, that they are known and beloved for, rightfully wow. so, because there are doing wonderful job on all of those. But all of a sudden, now you're opening up, expanding it a little bit to, you know, the comic book slash superhero crowd. And uh, one of the biggest highs that I've kind of gotten out of that um, initial toy for re reveal was the fact that it was one of the topics of the conversation. So within all of those... <clears throat> I consider that to be a uh, success and I hope that that translated financially to the, to Joel, um, the owner of the company. So one thing you may or may not be aware, uh, George, uh, is that the Phantom video game, which uh, is in development at the moment, uh, the owner and the, the mine or the person behind that, um, Ash Nichols, he actually uh, made mention that this figurine was, where he actually got the idea of pitching the video game from. So, and he credits the success of the figure with opening the door for mm. the conversation with King Features and their enthusiasm for his idea. That is, you just made my day. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. While we're talking about King Features, did you ever deal with them in any way? Like, did you, were you, did you go there to show them the figurines? Did you? pick up the phone or was that all Randy? Save all of their that feedback. Was all, and notes. <laughs> that, that was all Randy. And, yeah. and it's, it's, uh, I've never dealt with them directly. 
indirectly on on on, on a few different uh, different projects, but mm. meaning past NECA as well. So, um, so obviously one of the things that, and we've talked about this on the podcast, and we've talked about it in privately as well, is one of the things that really uh, tickled our fancy or got us all giddy with excitement as little uh, school children is the way that you made this box look like the Galoop box with the logo. It had that same feel. That, that, that retro that, feel. Yeah. So was that was that all you? Was that like I want it to feel like the, the Galoop figures and, you know, a bit of a nod to them and stuff like that? Was that, was that you? Yes. And it was very much that both Randy and myself were very much on the same page. Hmm. Um, so every single thing that I, that I've done with NECA, obviously it's, it's in between Randy and me. And then obviously the inclusion of many other wonderful artists there, uh, depending from project to project and specifically for, uh, Defenders of the Earth and the packaging. It was very much what I wanted to do with it, and Randy was was a hundred percent on the same page. My initial pitch to him was somewhat different, where it was supposed to be, in a lot of ways, a recreation of carded figure in the acetate box. So instead of like this being acrylic. It would have been the clear acetate box, however, and make it into more dimensional where the phantom um, painting would be popped to the front. So thusly, you just dimensionalize uh, the vintage figure. In terms of, however, when obviously cost is an issue and obviously uh, for this specific packaging, I was given the parameter of dimensions so walmart bought a certain quantity of it and they needed it to be within certain dimensions and that's what informed the size mm. and then the oh. rest of it was was we were okay it's a box now and if we wanted to make it a translation of the original vintage card art feel while uh, modernizing it so it needed to have the nostalgia shot from the same moment that you see it and to recognize it as such. However, the attempt was to make paintings more dynamic, more um, anatomically correct, I suppose. Um, and all the while to give homages to a lot of the graphic elements of the original, such as you look at this, this yellow burst, for example. So obviously we wanted to maintain that. Uh, you look at the yellow field behind the figure, obviously we wanted to maintain that. If you look at the top logo, up top on the, on the, on the figure's box, the earth is different. It's rendered yeah. entirely differently. Um, there was an omission. Um, in the original's art, there are three characters. Yeah. And Lothar is being really kind of shorthanded there. Agreed. Now, the thing is, I like this composition better because the phantom is in the middle and it's like triangular. However, I very much didn't think that it was fair towards Lothar because you kind of put him in the position of being Robin of Defenders of the Earth and kind of, okay, cool, he's a psychic, but he isn't he should be given the exact same importance as, you know, it, it's like the Beatles, essentially. So um, I went to the original, one of the original artworks. So I, I didn't make that art of those four characters up top. It was just one of the original drawings that was done by uh, an artist that was unknown to me, but it was, it was an official art. So... Even but, if you if you flip the the back of the packaging, it's very much maintaining the same, um, mostly the same uh, layout, and yes. with the exception of not having all of the uh, vehicles and so on, 
it's maintained the same body of, of type. However, we've included that, um, that little blurb of the character description. I believe it, it, it's in the blue uh, type. Um, and it's basically from, from the animated show. You know, when, when, when they start introducing the characters, so each one of the characters now has this blurb that was written by Stan Lee. And, you know, it's that whole theme and the intro of the Defenders of the Earth uh, animated show is so iconic. Cheesy as it is, it's wonderful. So I wanted to include that as well. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and it absolutely is. There's so much that retro feel and um, it's it's only as you've held that up on the screen and I've looked at my uh, my box of the, the NECA toy that you see exactly how closely you've replicated it. Um, you're also credited with the photography. Um, on the back, we've talked, to, um, we've talked about sculpting and, and we're discussing packaging, uh, photography and character illustration. So I presume you you, you took these photos of uh, of characters so that they could appear in the box. And, and was that yourself who, who drew the, the characters on the front as well? As far as photography goes, uh, I did all of the photography except for Garrix. And Garrix, okay. I keep on mentioning Garrix, Garrix uh, came later on and he was the only one that was uh, in the actual, um, actually he had two releases. One of them was the same box as what you're looking at now. And the other one is a complete um, homage to the, to the retro packaging on the card itself. Uh, for those, um, the photography was done by Steven. I am gonna butcher his last name, I think Mazurik. Uh, he is a long time uh, NECA photographer, wonderful photographer. Um, as far as the, the, the illustrations go, yes, I did all of those illustrations and each one of them was a collaboration in between uh, myself doing the, doing the illustration part and one of the three friends of mine who did the painting, who did the, the coloring of it. Being that you guys are the Phantom podcast. Oh, wow. so, so this is what I, what I gave to my friend Jack Tsai. And basically he did the, the coloring of it. Very well. Now, that was as far as like the defenders go. So obviously, each one of the characters. This this is what I what I would give to uh, the colorist, and then this one specifically was done by Nate Barge, another wonderful painter. Um, and when we go to the original superheroes, that was a little bit different. I did uh, both illustration and the coloring on them. And reason being is that they were supposed to be, for original superheroes, they were supposed to be um, done in a comic book style of the Golden Age. So the thing mm -hmm. is, I didn't want to have any of the more modernized, uh, intricate rendering, uh, and obviously more painterly feel. I wanted it to be very comic book of the 30s looking like if that makes sense. And, you know, these are some, obviously, Flash Gordon. And lastly, being the Merciless. Very well. Yeah. Oh, so... <laughs> I, I need to ask, Georgia, um, the with the Ming the Merciless in particular, is it an um, excellent design on your part or just lucky happenstance that your illustration of Ming appears to be holding the staff um, in the box? Is it, How much thought have you put it? Have you thought that through all the way? Is that just luck? <laughs> very much like you said. Uh, yes, it was, it was very much thought through on one end and originally he was supposed to have it in, in illustration. And then I was like, okay, that's gonna be blocking way too much of the figure. So it's, be it's best, you know, to let the figure speak. Mm. And we just placed the staff there, very clever. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, packaging juxtaposition, placement. So Georgia, just 
want to backtrack a little bit where you made mention of this figurine of this logo here, how you've got Lotha um, in the logo. I'm not sure if you know, but Rainbow, Rainbow, Rainbow. Toys, which did the, yep. um, uh, the English version of these actually had Lotha in the logo. So that was the yep. UK version. So um, yeah, it's, that's, I've, it's not very good condition, uh, original plastic, but um, yeah, so there you've got that. And then you also had the Italian version, which had the, the normal three as well. Well, since you're showing those, my very first encounter with Defenders of the Earth figures was the Italian, on Italia pack, packaging. Oh, wow. And at that, at, at that point, I went on a trip with my dad to Italy. We went on to this store, which was just stacked with amazing stuff. And some of which was already way past in, say, Germany or Switzerland, because we passed through, through the three of those. And only one single store had Defenders of the Earth. They had two Phantoms, one single Ming the Merciless, and they had a ton of... Uh, Flash Gordons, and they had none of the other characters. And I was pondering, should I get them or should I not? Because, again, I was kind of disappointed with the whole seeing it for the first time, the level of sculpting and da-da-da, but could not pass on the Phantom. So I picked up the Phantom and Ming the Merciless. Ming was done probably the best in terms of sculpting out of the bunch. And I actually passed on Flash Gordon because his face was just not satisfactory enough for me at the time. Fast forward, and then I found out years later about the Rainbow. And in some ways, in my mind, Rainbow iteration of the packaging gave me a permission, so to speak. Because again, it's not only about license or it's not only about my employer. It's not only about, in this case, whether or not obviously as important as it is and as pivotal as it is whether randy's gonna say yes or no to certain thing obviously that's gonna determine stuff or if king features are, are gonna say yes or no obviously that's gonna determine how it's gonna be but i also need to pass this mark in my head this invisible mark of am i staying true to again taking my selfish self out of the, the equation and going like am i doing justice to the property? Am I doing justice to the rest of the fans and so on? Am I fulfilling what they would like to see? So rainbow packaging specifically gave me, in my mind, permission to use that particular art. So yes, yeah. I was very much, very much aware of it. Oh, uh, I, I love that story. Um, yeah, so I, I believe that logo was done by Will, I can't remember his last name, but we had on this podcast, well, how many years ago, Dan? Maybe three, four. Um, Rick Hoberg, who was the art director of the TV oh, show, yeah. I believe he had something to do with the logo as well. So, but I, yeah, I'll have to, we'll have to go back and listen to that podcast. Thank you for sharing that with us and showing us those uh, original drawings as well. They, mm. they were beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. George, do, you, do NECA have any other plans going forward for this uh, this franchise? Like, I'm, you know, we've done Defenders of the Earth and then the original version, the original superhero uh, iteration of Defenders of the Earth. Could you see uh, ever coming out with a, a first Phantom or a 12th Phantom or, or, you know, working with the generations of that line? I am not sure how much I'm at liberty to talk because they haven't fully revealed their cards, I will say that there's plans way past what has been shown. I don't know if any of it is going to happen. Uh, they were not only plans, but fully executed further steps. And that's probably the best that I can leave it at. And apologies for being there. No, no, no. no uh, we, you got to... Yeah. He's in a situation where you get to plans are at a fully executed stage, like you just hinted at, uh, what would be the percentage of uh, of those uh, 
projects coming to fruition? Would that happen half the time, 80% of the time? I don't know. I'm just going to fish a little bit harder here, surely. <laughs> I, you mean what are the chances of it happening? Yeah. Honestly, it's so different from case to case. Uh, and okay. the reason why I'm being so vague is not only because I don't want to step my you know, are allowed boundaries, I suppose, sure. because it's just not my privilege to share before it's yeah. supposed to be shared if it is. Yeah. And another reason why is because what if it doesn't happen? Then it's like a huge disappointment, right? Sure. But trust me, I am a the Phantom fan through and through. And, uh, there are many things that could be explored and should be explored and could be absolutely wonderful. Mm. Um, I think to me, the Phantom was never one and done. While he's lacking arch nemesis that Flash Gordon has, or even Mandrake to a degree with Cobra, right? But Cobra is not all that well known, but he could make for a wonderful figure, I still maintain. The Phantom has other options which could be uh, so uh, appealing. So, so are we talking about things like a skull copter for the Defenders of the Earth? Are we talking about <laughs> hero, devil, um, all, of, some, all of the above? Cave, like, like you were talking about, was it um, He Man who had that big um, castle? Oh, grayscale. Grayscale. grayscale, you know, so we can have. I've, a I've still got a version of that in my, um, in my cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, uh, give us we, a wink and nod, can... a, 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 a nudge, yeah. nudge if, we, uh, if we're close. <laughs> we are talking about life size skull cave with a hero <laughs> in a table and the wolf, if we can tame it, absolutely. Or the devil. It's just a bunch. We're just a bunch of fans geeking out. <laughs> Are you in a place where you, do you still read the Phantom? Do you read it in the newspaper? Do you get the comics? Um, you know, are you are you still that much of a fan where you get to enjoy the comics every so often? Or, well, let me bring it full circle before I directly answer to that one. You were asking me about whether I'm a fan of Defenders, which I answered, and. I never answered about 2040. And I'm a huge fan of the 2040. And I felt that 2040 figurine. was... Figurine of 2040. Sorry? We could do it. So is that a hint that we might see a 2040 figurine with the um, uh, the Hypo motorbike? Life-size. <laughs> with the, oh, with the removable system and everything. Uh, reason why I'm saying this is because... Yes, that was like a gazillion years ago, but I never we're away from it too far. However, the life did kinda kinda not close me off, but rather I did not keep up with the newer stuff. I did, however, very much go back to the Raymore uh um uh, earliest comic books. And reading them all the way through, and obviously the whole Cyberi run on it, which is obviously extremely sizable. So the whole thing is that I don't keep up with it, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, mostly because it doesn't ring as the Phantom to me anymore. Because a lot of the interpretations are mostly uh, from the first glance appearing like more contemporary spin on another custom hero. It doesn't grab me in the same way. Maybe I'm prejudiced just based on those little glances that I have, but I am catching myself uh, reminiscing about Cyber years, and then I'm like, okay, why would I reminisce? Let's just go back and reread it. So I kept up with you know, going back and rereading those a lot more than I have been keep, keeping up with the newer stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that, so obviously 
there's Herms Press, which have been doing the reprint series. So I'm assuming that's probably what you've been purchasing. Yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So those are kind of almost a Bible, really, uh, mm. you know, in terms mm. of any comic book stuff where it's just wonderful seeing how well that truly holds up in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. there is not only charm of that era, which there is plethora of, but there is a, a true artistry that um, in a lot of ways gets to be kind of overlooked nowadays. Mm. Definitely. I have to ask, and uh, we, we've spoken glowingly in terms of the figures and and, and well we might, but can I um, just throw, I, I need to ask on behalf of a bunch of fans, um, George A, about um, the NECA figure and the, the the stiffness in the the articulated points um, as you get it out of the box. Is that a common NECA experience? We we became um, familiar with it because one of our um, one of one of the people we who work with comes from India, actually massive massive NECA fan, and he alerted us to okay when you take your fan and figure it out of the box the first time, you're gonna have to soak it in hot water, we'll really work the joints to get it moving and that sort of thing. Is that um, is that a common thing for NECA? And I just ask you about that. Of course, that is very much, sadly so, an issue on the Defenders of the Earth Way One, and that is very much not the issue on the original Superheroes Way One. Mm -hmm. Now, why am I saying it that way? Is because there are so many variables that come. Uh, into answering that question. First of all, your friend who is making that comment has every right to raise that concern because it's true. And sadly, a lot of us at NECA are very much um, not only aware of that, but are very much saddened and pained by the fact that the first run had that issue. And I was mentioning earlier on when uh, I was talking about inception of the action figure line of Defenders that kind of springed off from shoulders of the DC figures, right? What I didn't tell you is that those figures ended up in the end almost completely retooled because we, I think that I was driving both Randy and Stefan that I mentioned uh, prior, absolutely nuts with nitpicking certain things about fine-tuning the anatomy, fine-tuning uh, the figures from China to be as close as possible to our prototypes. Yeah. So that, while it came with the price of again, just driving people nuts and, and spending a lot of additional time that most people will not see the nuances of, in my view, it resulted in a lot better figures. A lot better figures. Likewise, all of those issues are very much something that, you know, we were aware and uh, uh, very much wanted to address and fix. So it was such a misfortunate thing. Is it is it common for NECA? It honestly depends from figure to figure. Not that it's so random, but rather, I'm not sure if you are aware, but there are several different factories that any given toy company is using. In NECA's case, they you know get the bids from certain companies and then they decide where they're gonna uh, uh, land certain project or projects on. And specifically, Sometimes it becomes way too late to fix certain things or way too costly. So if you can if you can't fix it in the in the first round, then you will do your best to fix it in the second round. There was another issue regarding those figures, which is that there uh, in the first wave specifically, I'm looking if I have the first wave figures here, and if you look at Superman's wrist disc it is cast in a different color plastic from yes. his fists and his fists were painted now that was fixed for the original superheroes because 
if you look at Flash Gordon and his wrist, it's cast. The skin color is the color of the plastic. So his face, his torso, and his hands were, oh, I'm sorry, I'm like aiming really badly, <laughs> were cast in the color of the skin. And in my view, um, all of the joints, like the hip joints, were entirely redone in between the DC uh, heroes and the Wave 1 of the Defenders to the original superheroes and the Wave 2 of the Defenders. So yeah, right. every time, whenever, whenever uh, NECA gets all of the feedback, whether or, not, um, whether or not that's visible or even obvious, trust me, uh, people at NECA are very much tremendous fans of all of the properties that, that you know, we're privileged to be working on. So the thing is that we don't take it lightly. And if, uh, you know, we, as unintentionally as, as it ends up being, uh, disappoint fans with whatever the case may be, we bust our asses, pardon my French, to try to fix the problem and try to improve constantly. So hopefully, oh, look, hopefully that helps. Yeah, look, I've got I've got no doubt that's the case. And for what it's worth, part of um, you know uh, my layman's understanding of why the joints are so stiff is because they're so finely um, tuned in terms of fitting together. And uh, what the, the effect that that has is, no matter how, and the shoulders, for instance, no matter whether you put the shoulders up or round or back or whatever, it looks like a, a prop. It, there's no gaps open up. There's no um, bulges where there shouldn't be bulges. It just looks natural the whole way. Um, and and surely it, for me, the, there was absolutely no. I guess because I had the the warning from uh, from Ankit from India, who had sent through a little video going, okay, when you open it up, make sure you 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 run it under hot water and all the rest of it. It was actually fun to to give it a bath and to um, to, <laughs> to manipulate the joints until it was ready to go. And and uh, now you know probably once a month or or every six weeks, I pop downstairs and as part of uh, just playing around with the collection. Oh, maybe he should be kneeling down. Maybe he should be holding the skull throne. Maybe he needs a gun out this time. You know, just that manipulation, and it's always, it's it's great to see the um the collection be a bit dynamic and movable like that. So you certainly can't achieve that with a glued figure. I'll tell you that. <laughs> to stick out for our friend from India, some of those uh, 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 comments and feedback were very much justifiable in a sense that. I personally haven't had any problems with my copies of the figures, but I have seen some really unfortunate videos on YouTube. If somebody's like taking it and starts playing with it and then the leg falls off. Now it's not to the best of my knowledge. It's not something that's, uh, that's super common, but yes, it, it should not be that way. And yes, all of us are certainly aspiring always to improve. And mm. it's not something that either, one and NECA goes and says like to bed, you know, type of a thing. It's it's always a sore spot and it's always very much taken in in consideration, if you will, you know. Now we we do have to ask um George A and part of how you've um you know we've been loving these toys for years and and part of how we've finally been able to get in touch with you was because you popped up in some photos on social media um e attending the Sardis dinner earlier this year with Lee Fo the the Lee Fork memorial um or, or, or um remembrance dinner if you like coming together with Cy Barry in particular and um and we were able to get your contact details that way can you talk to us a little bit about um, how you came to to go to the dinner, your experience there, and, and what it's like to actually um, get in in a venue um, with a bunch of fandom fans and just be able to talk fandom over over a meal and and just enjoy everyone's company. Kid in the candy shop. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the 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 whole the whole story behind that one is that it was a product of my wife's. 50th birthday present uh, for me, meaning that I wanted to meet Cy Berry for years and years. And given that Cy Berry is going on 26 years of age right now, <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, uh, and, and I am getting up there in age, so I certainly uh, don't take any moment for granted. So I'm thinking 
I've had countless conversations with my dad who passed his love towards the Phantom onto me. You know, again, life mimics the, the fiction or vice versa. Who knows, right? What was meant to be. So that was also passed from generation to a generation, much like he passes his mantle. So in, in the same vein, I wanted to meet the man who, for me, embodied the Phantom the best. Mm. And I wanted to pass it on to my daughter. And I wanted to experience that with her, much like my dad passed it on to me. So I was trying to get in touch with, with Cy Berry for a few years now. And I wasn't tremendously successful. And, you know, unbeknownst to me, my wife was trying to do the same thing in order to surprise me with it. And somehow I found out about any of his appearances on any of the, you know, comic cons after the fact. And I, I never knew which one he would attend. Long story short is that my wife told me that, that you know, she had a trip planned for me. And then at the, not last moment, but certainly moments before she told me what it was so that I can at least be prepared and not be like shell-shocked about it. <laughs> so in some way, it was a pilgrimage that we took because we live in New York. And um, Cy lives in the uh, overall area of Boston. So we basically took a trip to Boston just solely for that purpose to just basically shake his hand and say hello. And uh, mm. all of the correspondence was done in between uh, my wife, Lucky, and um, David, uh, Sai's son. And I don't know really how, without sounding too bombastic, but to just verbalize how grateful I was, because again, he doesn't know me from a hole in the wall. For all he knows, I could be a psychopath. And, you know, there's just some random people contacting him. So this is Lily, my daughter. Oh. Hi, and, Lily. Uh, so, so basically, uh, we, you know, are just strangers, just <clears throat> out of the blue, and, and said um, that we would love to meet him and, you know, wrote pretty much some of the things that we were talking about and uh they were super grateful uh, super uh, gracious and met us we went on to a lunch and just basically met him for the first time and we had the, the most wonderful time because it was uh, surprisingly family like atmosphere where oh. it felt truly like a family and he felt truly like We've known each other for the for the really long time, and um, both of those guys were were wonderfully human. That's probably the best way that I can summarize it. And it was wonderful to reminisce about the times that I was never a part of, in close proximity, and kind of uh, I can't remember an English term, but it was indirectly because. A part of my head and a part of my heart was living in the 30s through those comic books, through those movies. And it was surreal to really talk to Cyberry about what Harold Foster was like. And Harold Foster is and always will be one of my biggest heroes, really, because Prince Valiant is, is in my view, a monument of of comics and to just you know talk to somebody who was rubbing elbows with him so to speak and and it's really interesting really surreal oh. um mm -hmm. but that's that's how it began so we had like uh, the most wonderful whatever it was few hours whatever and then they invited us to the to the sardis uh dinner so then fast forward to whatever it was like a half year later or, or something. Um, then, uh, ciao. then basically we, uh, I came there with, with my daughter. My wife was, wasn't able to make it at the time. And it was, you know, kid in the candy shop, really. Um, <laughs> like all things phantom. 
<laughs> yes, yes. No, we, we, we know of that. We have a, a similar um, get-together over here in Australia. And, yeah, the kid in the candy store is a very good way of uh, just of describing it. Speaking of which, do you mind me asking you a question? No, um, of course not. please, please ask us. One is how big is the Phantom in Australia? Because I know that there's a large following, but translating to, say, the figures, how present were the Defenders of the Earth, NECA figures, how present were the original superheroes? Were they, were they noticed? How did it go there? It, it certainly wasn't as big as landing in a Walmart type thing. Mm. We don't have Walmart here, but we've got um, department stores, not unlike it. It never landed and went as mainstream as that. Unfortunately, and Jim, you may know more about this than I do, but unfortunately there was a bit of a um, a breakdown with the importers and, uh, and the license holders and that sort of thing in Australia. So the NECA figures didn't quite get the... Um, I mean, there's a huge following of the Phantom in Australia, but it didn't, was never quite as available, certainly as it appeared to be in America. Would that that that'd be fair to say, Jim? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, a lot of the toy stalls, like the specialty pop culture stalls, did stock them in, but it was a yes. it was probably about two three months after they were released in Amer in America. Yeah, we we and would certainly love. Love to see them in in the mainstream stores, just alongside um, the Barbies and the the Kens and the the Ninja Turtles and that sort of thing. Um, but it, it was a little bit um, comic book stores and um, yeah, pop culture stores in particular that you had to go through. And and that's certainly where I got all of mine. And um, shout out to my local comic book store. Um, I think you were the same, Germ. Your your local got you those. Uh, there was a company in Melbourne. Yeah, I, th I can't remember the the name of the company, but yeah. So there was a couple couple around the place that brought them in yeah how much how much uh is the phantom popular nowadays in australia probably not as much as in the 80s or the 90s there, there is a, a week uh, no sorry a fortnightly comic book that comes out that would sell in the region of i don't know 20,000 15 to 20,000 a fortnight copies i would have thought um so that gives you some indication as to the popularity of it um, is, there's certainly some of the comics here that we're talking about can come out only a, a week and a half ago sort of thing um, and um, yeah there'd be a lot more than 20,000 people who would call themselves fandom fans in Australia I would have thought and, and certainly part of the um, is definitely part of the uh, what it means to be an Australian and understand your pop culture is is to know about the Phantom much more like than what we hear about from America, where sometimes it appears that they've never heard of it, sort of thing. Yeah, certainly that's that's a part of the reason why it was such a upstream swim for the Phantom and why I did uh, verbalize and and constantly keep on uh, reiterating my appreciation towards what Randy had said yes to and made happen. I am still a little bit in disbelief that it happened because, you know, it meant so much to me. Um, and at the same time, it was, you know, like I said, a, a little bit of a steep mountain to, to climb. And it's just wonderful to see that not only that they were done, at least how I, I was hoping for them to be done, but rather there, there was a lot of true love behind it, not only from, from my part, but from other artists who were involved, from the painters to, you know, additional photography to uh, all of the, the production, well, fabricating. There, there was some awesome fabricating on it. Um, mm. And the whole production aspect in China, how there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of fine tuning and a lot of, uh, invisible hours that went into it but in the end it's it's when i was preparing you know to like show the figures um it's kind of surreal really but yeah very oh, happy I, I should have asked actually you showed us the artwork for the boxes do the do the original sculpts that you you made um do they still exist do you still have them do they live do they live at headquarters or what ha what happens to those how familiar are you with with the uh, 
process of toy, toy making? Should I start from from scratch or? Yeah, I've got almost no familiarity. Basically, the originals themselves. The short answer is that I have most of them. The thing is that um, after I sculpt a figure, like like we were talking. Uh, after I block out all of the anatomy, start tightening it up, then I cut it out in pieces, right? So to include all of the articulation, all of that is done in the original sculpt. So it becomes a bunch of pieces, it becomes like this. Huh? And uh, I'll open it up and, and I'll show you in a second. But basically, um, this is not the original. This is the resin copy of the original. And it's essentially. Yeah, right. Oh, wow. It's almost like a um, like those kits you get. You know those kits that you glue together and the resin. Kits. Almost yes. Yeah. Now, so basically, I'll show you the color of this castling clay is this greenish color that you see here. Mm. I just put it to kind of place the head on top so that it doesn't fall. So that is then sent to a molder. Molder basically makes a, a silicone mold around it, pours in silicon mold uh, or liquid silicone, and then it needs about 24 hours to cure. It gets cut, you open it up, you take the original out, you throw the original away, or in my case, you grab that original, which oftentimes gets to be a little bit damaged in the process of opening up and so on, and you keep it. And then you close up the silicone mold, you pour in resin, and that cures in about 10, 15 minutes. You open it up, clean up the edges, and then it becomes what I just showed you, right? Oh. Then you take a couple of those copies, one copy, which is unpainted, goes to China, and they basically make steel molds based on that particular one. Mm. And the second copy goes to the painters. So in Eka's case specifically, there are a number of wonderful painters who are in-house, and then they basically paint a prototype. And in a lot of cases, put in so many different uh, intricacies, and then they uh, correspond with China, making sure that all of those nuances get to be translated as intended. Oftentimes there are issues, it doesn't look like it's supposed to, and then they go back and forth until it gets to be fine-tuned to the best of circumstances. In some cases, it becomes wonderful. In some cases, not so much. In the case of Defender specifically, I was, pretty much over the moon happy with the final result. Mm. Uh, a part of it is the fact that now they're applying all of the face painting digitally. So thusly, the margin for error has decreased. Um, then you get one test shot from China um, as your last step before the mass production which is unpainted and looks something like this. Yeah, well. Wow. So this is very much, unlike the resin copy that I showed you, it's exactly the same way you can move it. It's, it's uh, cast in plastic, but it's just unpainted. And in some cases, it has, um, it has certain issues where, whatever, the gap in the shoulder may be half a millimeter too big or, you know, uh, the joint in a hip could be fine-tuned to fit more snugly. And that's your last chance to do any of the fine-tuning. Once you do the fine-tuning, then you get your first painted copy. And then the painters, basically, or art director, goes over it. Um, then they decide if there's any issues that need to be addressed back and forth until you get the, the final copy. And lastly, you get the packaging, you get the figure in the packaging, and that's that's what you get on the market. Mm. Mm. That's fascinating. I'm, um, I've 
got a prototype of one of I've got a prototype of the rings from the ninety six and a prototype of the pirate, um, uh, that didn't end up getting created with the ninety six um, movie. But I find all that stuff just fascinating, like the original artwork that you've showed us, the um, mm. uh, like the the bits and pieces that you showed, like. I would be one of those ones as well. It's like, no, 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 don't throw it away. I want to keep it. I want to keep it and stuff like that. So it's um, yeah. it's so good to hear, Giorgio, that you saved all of that. It, you know, as if you'd let that go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I can't fathom because, again, it's not a job. You pour in your heart mm. and soul. Oftentimes, you know, I remember early on in in my career my wife would be sleeping next to me basically. And I would, uh, you know, kind of um, not be very helpful with her uh, sleeping pattern by still working at 4 a.m., you know, trying to catch up with the deadline or whatever the case is. And, mm -hmm. you know, you truly invest yourself in, it's an extension of you. So I can't imagine just like, okay, cool, it's a job. <laughs> let it go so yeah no absolutely um and and so you're in a bit of a a collector's cave of your own there um oh, yeah. You, yeah so do you you surround yourself with other people's stuff or your own stuff mostly very much all over the place i am uh apologizing for not being able to show you like uh no. my studio because he there's way too much stuff there, uh, which is not in order. Let's put it that way. And uh, so it's somewhat embarrassing. But as far as like my collecting, I I am a little bit more um, selective nowadays, but I have a ton of stuff. And I am very much a fan of other people's work as well. And um, I collect probably way too many uh lines for my own good so yes very much all over the place it's all right we've, <laughs> we 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 have the same problem as well yeah, um really so <laughs> this was this here's the uh the pirate that was supposed to be released with this dude but never ended up getting released and so that was a, a prototype of him probably for is the best or is it sorry <laughs> Is that a resin copy or is it is it plastic? Uh, no, is it is articulated? Um, but yeah, I don't, it's not. It doesn't look the best. Doesn't look. Very, I still wonder idea of the, of his existence. Mm, mm. So yeah, so when you're showing me stuff like that, I um yeah, that I'm just totally geeking out as well. So I appreciate you showing us that. I, I genuinely wish I could I could share a couple of more things, but hopefully in time we'll see. Look, uh, George, we we're conscious. You know, you, you, your family's starting to get up. It's uh, um, it's the your, your weekend's about to get underway over there. We we probably need to wrap this up. Um, it's been absolutely a delight to talk to you. What is your handle on Instagram? We need to tell people what it is. It is D J O R D J E. D J O K O V I C A R T. George Djokovic Art. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll make sure that we um that we that we share that link and um it'll be certainly something we'll be starting to follow and um and, and share anything that we can that's relevant, certainly to it to, to the Phantom Universe. So no, thank you so much for that. All right. Well, again, thank you for your time tonight. And and for those of you who are listening or watching, um, certainly make sure you hit up George A on his uh, Instagram page. If this, tonight's shown you anything, there's so many creators with so many skills that uh, that bring their uh, talents to the Phantom Universe. Um, if there's anyone else that you can think of that you'd like us to have a chat to, have an interview with, or re-interview even, if you had a, a favourite guest, please make sure you contact us. Our website is chroniclechamber.com um, or you can email us at chroniclechamber at gmail.com. Make sure that you subscribe on the on the website so that you get notified of any new posts. Um, and as I said right at the outset, follow us and subscribe on you, your podcast app or on the YouTube channel so that you know when these things drop. Thank you so much to, uh, to George A again. Thanks, Germ. Thanks, uh, everybody, for watching. And uh, until next time, happy fandoming. Happy fandoming, everyone. Thank you so much, guys. Have a wonderful day. 
500 years ago he washed ashore the sole survivor of a shipwreck and upon the skull of the man who killed his dad he said i'm mad i must eradicate piracy injustice and cruelty and all my sons will follow me so evil doers will believe that this man cannot die the phantom the ghost who walks the phantom enemies beware the phantom's always there but you won't find the phantom he finds